What's up, guys? Such an amazing episode here with Dr. Dennis McKenna. We spent some time just going through his life and the life of his brother and their adventures or misadventures. I really enjoyed this conversation, so hopefully you do too. Please pick up a copy of Dr. McKenna's book. You can find the link to that below. If you enjoy what we're doing at HXP, please donate. It helps us cover the server costs. Please also subscribe to our YouTube channel. Follow us on Twitter at TheHumanXP. And if you're feeling extra generous, leave us a review on Stitcher and iTunes. Thank you so much for listening. Amazing episode. Thanks, guys. The human experience is joining the brotherhood of the screaming abyss as we welcome my guest, Mr. Dennis McKenna. Mr. McKenna, it's an honor to have you here, sir. Welcome to HXP. Thank you, Xavier. It's a pleasure to be here. Sir, you are in the holy trinity of uh, psychedelic researchers for me to interview. So, yeah, I really appreciate it. I, For the people that don't know what you do or who you are, can you just give us a brief introduction? Well, uh... I, I'm an ethnopharmacologist, uh, and uh, that's a person who studies basically the use of medicinal plants or, you know, uh, in indigenous cultures, not necessarily restricted to that, but that's kind of the thumbnail definition. And uh, in, as you probably already know, and your listeners already know, my own specialty in that area has been psychedelic plants and fungi, especially ayahuasca. I've worked, uh, I did my PhD thesis on, on the chemistry and botany and pharmacology of ayahuasca. So that makes me a, a FUD. I, I am a doctor, but I don't care. You can call me Mr. Doesn't matter. <laughs> I'm informal. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but so that's that's been what I've been studying and and been passionate about really for well over thirty years because uh, you know if if your listeners are familiar with my story and my the story of my brother and me then you know that we first went to South America in search of exotic hallucinogens in uh, nineteen seventy one. So I've been at this a long time. Uh, we went down there, not you know, thinking that we knew what we were looking for, uh, thinking that we knew a lot more than we actually did, and you know, and really, <laughs> we had not a clue what we were getting into. But I guess that's how you know real adventures happen. I mean, if you if 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 what you expect happens, then it's not really an adventure. Yeah, yeah. I'd definitely like to get into your trip down there a bit more later in the conversation. But just sure. to start things off, uh, how did you become first become interested in the properties of psychedelic compounds? Was there a single event that turned you on to them, or was it more of a gradual thing? Well, it was... It was, it was not a single event, uh, exactly, but... You know, I, I grew up in the 60s, and, uh, you know, my, my teenage years coincided exactly with the 60s. I was, I was 10 in, 19, in 1960, and I was 20 in, 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 uh, in 1970. So, you know, uh, and that was the era of the counterculture. So Terrence and I were both uh, quite immersed in the counterculture in some ways, uh, we were certainly fascinated by by psychedelics, and uh, Terence was four years older than me, living in Berkeley at the time and going to school. So, and I was still stuck in this small town in Colorado, uh, kind of waiting for 
you know, postcards from the edge in a sense. I mean, I felt quite hard done by that Terrence got to be at the center of the of the cultural format and I was, you know, still isolated. But he would come home at Christmas time and in the summers and so on and and bring stories of what was going on uh, out in the wider world and bring bring drugs actually <laughs> starting starting with cannabis uh, I got my first introduction to uh, cannabis in 1966 and then when uh, and then in 1967 which was kind of a banner year in the in the countercultural movement the summer of love in San Francisco I went to Berkeley with a friend of mine and we stayed at Terrence's place, various places around the Bay Area for some weeks. And uh, that's when we had our first encounter with LSD, or my first encounter. And uh, I guess the, uh, the thing that really got us interested in this to the point where we dedicated our lives to it was, was our early encounters with DMT. Uh, DMT was not around much. It was actually quite rare in those days, but you could get it. Terrence was able to get it by working the matrix and different connections or whatever. And when DMT got on our radar, we were just astounded, both of us. And we decided that, you know, this is too big to ignore. We'd had LSD, we'd had mescaline, we had things like that. There were no mushrooms around in those days, but we had those two, and they were interesting. But DMT was a, seemed of a whole other magnitude, a whole other order of strangeness. And, you know, as I've, I've told people many times, it, it wasn't simply the, the most interesting drug that we'd ever encountered. It was the most interesting thing that we'd ever encountered. Uh, you know, in our entire lives, and and so we we thought, well, you know, we we've got to go after this. This is a true mystery. So we, uh, I mean, I guess we imbued it with a bit of romanticism. We were both young in those days. We were, you know, restless, and uh, we wanted to push the envelope in whatever ways we could. So when we encountered DMT, and then later when we learned that it's a component of many of these indigenous uh, psychedelics used in South America, we thought, well, you know, we've got to go. We've got to go after it. So that's what led us to go there in 1971. And if you've read The Invisible, if you've read True Hallucinations, which is my brother wrote about our trip down there, or The Brotherhood of the Screaming Abyss, uh, which I wrote recently as a memoir of our whole life, but the expedition to La Chirera plays a big part of it, you know, and then and then also the other book that deals with it is The Invisible Landscape, uh, which was our attempt to, that one came out first, actually, and that was our attempt to, in some ways, rationalize or explain not very well what had happened to us down there and what what ideas and concepts we came back with, which were, you know, a number of peculiar notions about time and, and the nature of reality and and many other things. Yeah, definitely. Do you still use psychedelic compounds? Uh yes. Yes, I do. I, I take ayahuasca on a pretty regular basis. Uh, usually I go to South America to do that. So, yeah, ayahuasca, uh, you know, at the time it wasn't really in our purview at all. But later, when I returned to South America 10 years later in 1981, ayahuasca was the, was the f- focus of my thesis research. And uh, so I got to know about ayahuasca, you know, within a traditional cultural context at that time and it's been an important uh, teacher and medicine for me ever since. It's 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 a it's an ally for sure. That and mushrooms, which which I still do take, not as much as ayahuasca, but 
enough to check in, you know. <laughs> I haven't I haven't really left these things behind. Uh so I, I guess that means I'm hard headed and haven't got the message yet or you know, or the dialogue is ongoing. I mean I, I still learn from these experiences and you know, um yeah. So. Was there was there a pivotal moment in which you decided to make a sort of scientific career out of this and move beyond a casual spiritual interest? Uh yeah. Yeah, I would say so. Um, well, ag again, it, the experiment at La Chirera was really pivotal in that, you know, when we went to La Chirera in search of this this orally active form of DMT called ukuhe, which was a preparation used by the Witoto Indians primarily, we went. We had experienced DMT in 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 the Bay Area in Berkeley in the '60s, but I don't know if you know how it's taken. It it's smoked. The free base is smoked, and when you do it that way, it's astonishing. It's overwhelming, but it's also very short. It only lasts maybe 20 minutes at the outside. And it's very hard to bring anything back from it other than the fact that, yeah, it was astonishing and amazing and moving, but you can't say much more about it. And so we, uh, we had this idea that if we could spend a longer time in that dimension, we might be able to learn more about it and bring more information back that was useful. So when we had learned about, when we stumbled on this paper by Ari Schultes, uh, who was the famous Harvard ethnobotanist, well known in, in those circles as kind of the father of ethnobotany and the world's expert at the time on hallucinogenic plants, we stumbled on this paper that he wrote called Virola as an Orally Active Hallucinogen. And Varola is a genus of trees in the nutmeg family, not that that matters, but in a genus of trees that they extract the, the, the sap. Essentially, they extract the sap from these trees, which are loaded with DMT and 5-methoxy-DMT. And in some tribes, like the Yanomamo tribe, they prepare them as snuffs, so they... You know, they grind, they pout, they dry the the resin down, they dry the sap down, mix it with ashes, powder it, and they take it as a snuff. This other preparation was not that. It was uh, it was uh, it was made from virola resin, but instead of powdering it into a fine powder, they actually made a paste out of it, which was which was then orally ingested in the form of little little pills or little boluses of this sticky resin. Now, the reason that's important is the DMT is not orally active. Uh, you have to, which is why you have to take it as a snuff, or in the case of synthetic DMT, it's usually smoked in a free base form, because if you take it orally, it's destroyed by enzymes in the gut called monoamine oxidase inhibitors. And these are there in order to protect from exactly this kind of thing, you know, toxic amines in the diet. It's probably an evolutionary reflection of that that, that has grown up. But if you go around the gut, if you take it as a snuff or you take it you know, by smoking it, it doesn't go through that. So it's active, but it's still very short acting. So the oral activity prolongs it because you've got you change what they call the pharmacokinetics of it. It takes instead of ten or fifteen minutes, it takes four or five hours to to uh, you know to metabolize. So it's a very different experience and and much more you know much more of a learning experience in some way. And and that's the basis of ayahuasca. That's the basic formulation of ayahuasca is a combination of two plants, one of which contains DMT, the other contains 
a group of alkaloids called beta carbolines that are very strong inhibitors of this enzyme, monoamine oxidase. So if you boil these two things up together and take it, it becomes an, it becomes a, a strong hallucinogenic brew. If you if you took the DMT plant by itself and drank it, nothing would happen because it would be destroyed by MAO. So I mean, have you have you ever questioned your sanity at all through this? I mean, <laughs> I know that some of these experiences are pretty intense. Uh all the time. <laughs> Some would say I'm, I'm I'm wacko now, but yeah, I mean, I guess if you mean during the experiences, uh, yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, there are moments when you begin to wonder if you're losing it, for sure. If they're if they're extremely intense, uh, I have at times, uh, but. You know, a, a, as you do it, you sort of get a little more accustomed to it. Even though, even though the experiences are astonishing and very intense, you do. You know, you learn you learn to navigate in the territory, and you kind of know what to what to expect. You know, so your the focus rarely becomes on. You know the two the two major concerns. One, am I going to? Am I ever coming back? And two, am I going to die? You know, and, and well, so far so good, right? <laughs> I, I have neither died nor lost it completely. Um, and uh, you know, there 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 are things you can do to kind of uh, keep your center, I guess, keep your balance in these altered states and experience helps, you know, uh, I, I, I don't know, uh, exactly if your audience is, is sophisticated about psychedelics or knowledgeable about it or, or, or not. So I would say they are. Um, okay. That's good. So, yeah. I, so, so they will, they will know about, they will know about the importance of set and setting. Right. Yes. And the, and dose. There are basically three key variables with psychedelics: set, setting, and dose. And the setting is is the setting. It's it's where you do it, the circumstances that you that you do it under, uh, and you know to assure a good outcome of a trip, you have to pay a lot of attention to the right setting. Once you have the setting appropriate. You know, and depending on what you want, it could be various things. But you know, the important thing is that there be a structure to it, and I think that's that's really an important aspect of of the role of ritual in in these experiences. It helps guide it. It helps. It provides a you know a context in which it can happen. I mean, you you can take psychedelics outside of a group setting. You can take it without a shaman. All of these things you can just lock yourself in a room and do it by yourself, and that's fine. But that's going to be a different kind of experience than if it's a if it takes place in a ritual context with music and with the shaman sort of guiding the situation. So setting is important. And then the set is the other important variable, and that's that's basically what you bring to it: who you are, everything you've learned up to that point, what you expect to get out of this, uh, your intention for taking it. You know, it calls for some some introspection and some thinking about why am I doing this, and and what are what what benefit do I hope to you know, realize from having this experience. And, of course, the more you know uh, about virtually everything, the more you will get out of it. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, kind of just like any other experience, you know, the, the more you know, the richer the richer life is. So, you know, my, my brother told me, for example, before I had taken LSD, he said, wait until you have read psychology and alchemy by cg jung before you take lsd 
you know, you'll learn a lot more. You'll appreciate a lot more if you've read that book. Well, of course, I ignored him. I mean, I took LSD, <laughs> you know. But later, I, I read Psychology and Alchemy, and I, I could see what he was saying, you know. I mean, it made a certain amount of sense. Uh, if you haven't read that book, it's uh, it's well worth looking into. It's 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 really a very psychedelic book. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, there's there's kind of an interesting relationship between you and your brother, kind of a rivalry. I mean, would you say that? Uh, there is, it seemed like at the beginning of it, he kind of tormented you a lot. I mean, you wrote about this in your book. Yes. Well, I don't think any more than other siblings do. I mean, siblings, you know, uh, we were we were just far enough apart Actually, it's probably good. We were four years apart in age, you know, so we weren't so close that we were constantly together or constantly in competition. But it did happen. I don't think that our sibling rivalries were any worse than anybody else's. I, I think it's a totally normal thing. Uh, his creativity and imagination you know in terms of thinking up exotic and novel ways to make my life miserable that may have been a little different than most normal people he was very creative that way you know but but i got i got my my uh, hits in too you know i i mean i don't know if you have if you've had sim siblings if you have a younger brother, you probably know how this goes on, you know. So, uh, yeah, that was that was early on, but then later, uh, you know, we we sort of evolved out of all that, um, and we became friends and and colleagues, really, and sort of fellow explorers on this path. Uh, you know, Terence introduced me to a lot of these things, but I wasn't only a follower. You know, I brought my own sort of chops to it, and and that was that was really a big factor in terms of I think our you know our evolving beyond this this simple sibling rivalry. You know, was the fact that he found he found that I was into some cool stuff. Too. It wasn't just him, and he could appreciate it, and I could certainly appreciate what he was doing. So we we discovered mutual interests, and and this all happened, you know, around the time that I was, you know, in our, um, you know, maybe the period from the time that I was about eight to twelve. Or so, and then when I was twelve, Terence left. You know, he was he finished high school in California. So, uh, you know, much of my life I was essentially an only child with, you know, my brother uh, on the West Coast. And oddly enough, when he was on the West Coast, you know, we got along a lot better. <laughs> I mean, it, it it you know it worked out that way. <laughs> was there was there ever something that you felt like Terrence just couldn't understand, or anything that he challenged got challenged with? Uh, in in what in our in regards to or? no in regards to I don't know psychedelics or just something that he was maybe working on that he felt that he just didn't couldn't get a grasp on. Well. Uh, I guess the one thing maybe that uh, that would fit that is uh, you know when when we came back from La Chirera, he he at at La Chirera, he was downloaded or or uh, you know channeled this whole idea about the time wave which uh, you know if there was an artifact of any kind or an insight or a discovery that came out of our misadventure at La Chirera, the time wave was certainly one of those things. And it was a mathematical system based on the I Ching uh, that purported to describe the structure of time. 
Yeah, he was getting into novelty theory, time wave zero there, right? All of all of those things, you know. And later in life, when he was working on this, I think he, you know, I, I mean, I, in some ways, I'm a critic of the time wave. I, I was always very skeptical about it, whether it really described those things, whether you even could describe those things. I was willing to accept the premise that, you know, the basic premise that, time did have a structure and that novelty does exist and it, it ingresses, you know, into reality. This is, this is pure Whiteheadian metaphysics, basically. I disagreed with him that I think the basic idea was sound, but I disagreed with him that uh, the notion that the time wave really described the structure of time uh, and that, you know, given that, it could be used to predict events. And as it turned out, it, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't so good for that. Nothing uh, really happened in 2012. Nothing really happened in 2012. And and 2012 was just one of several dates. Uh, that was the whole conundrum with the time wave zero, how do you lay those that energy wave across time? Mm -hmm. Where do you postulate the beginning and the end point? It's hard to know. There's no mathematical way to evaluate novelty, and this was an attempt to do that. But my criticism of, of his approach was that it was always based on just subjective interpretation. You know, I mean, I had two two problems with the time wave. One was he was the only person who could who could interpret it, right? Because because the interpretation was subjective, and he was unable to state what would disprove it. You know, what would be the the criterion or the piece of evidence that would completely sort of invalidate the theory. And he would never go there. He would never. He was unable to define it. And theories, if if they want to, you know, if they want to qualify for that name, a theory has to state what disproves it, what what will overturn it, or at least not. You know, in science, which is kind of the game we're playing here, you know, th you never prove theories. You can only disprove them. Uh, you know, there's no because theories are not settled matters. I mean, if you look at uh, cosmology, for example, or physics, you know, Einstein's theories of relativity uh, are pretty accepted. Um, they are they come as close, uh, you know, as possible to a proven theory, and the and the scientific community that thinks about these things is pretty comfortable with Einstein's general and special theory of relativity but you always have to keep the door open that next week or tomorrow or a hundred years from now we'll make a discovery that will completely overturn those theories you know or make it necessary to modify them in a radical way so that they're not really those theories anymore that's science at its best you know science develops theories they develop models and hypotheses about the way the world works, about certain phenomena. And then, if it's honest with itself, which, you know, it often isn't, because science is a whole lot of things. It, does, it's, it, it doesn't happen in a pure vacuum, as perhaps ideally it should. But assuming that it does, so science develops models, it develops hypotheses, and then, and then you try like hell to disprove them. <laughs> you know, that's the way it works. You try to say, what does this theory not explain? Mm -hmm. And that was the problem with the time wave. He could not articulate what would invalidate the theory. So it's not a theory. It is, it's an idea. It's a model. But is the model supported by evidence probably not you know and and eventually you know i mean there were various you know ways that you could examine the theory to try to figure out if there was something there but a lot of it 
in 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 his case had to do with the end point and finally he got around to defining this end point as december 21st 2012 for various reasons it wasn't only that it happened to coincide with the end of the mayan calendar i mean that was that actually came a, a bit later after he had postulated an end point close to that date but not exactly that date so you know after looking at cycles of multiple billions of years he figured well you know we're within a few days of this very important date so let's you know that's probably it right the mayans had this intuition from a completely different perspective you know but as we now know three years later actually not much happened on december 21st 2012 yeah uh, much to everyone's disappointment <laughs> you know yeah. I mean, I I was hoping, believe me, but I wasn't really expecting much. <laughs> I mean, what did you What did you think would happen? I mean, what would you What did oh, you hope all for? the all the speculations? You know, I mean, if you just base it on the time wave, the idea was that this ingression of novelty, uh, you know, into the continuum of would just accelerate to a point where you actually where the density of novelty was was so high. That you were essentially in a singularity, you know. Wow. We we didn't know what would happen. It would be some sort of collapse, really, of the space time continuum. It's 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 what happened when when you come to the end of time. I mean, you know. But who knows? Because yeah. it's ne it's never happened. Yeah. And in that sense, it probably never will happen. So you know, it was. It's very difficult to predict the end of the world. You know, it's almost always you're going to be disappointed. Or if you do, or if you do, just don't give a specific date. Well, keep exactly. Keep it as open exactly. as possible. Yeah, exactly. And in that sense, in that sense, I think that the theory is valid in a certain sense. I, I think you don't need the time wave. I think we all share a certain sense that things are accelerating and they're getting stranger and stranger. <laughs> and, you know, I mean, all you have to do is look around, you know, and if you try and think back how the world is today versus how it was even, even 10 or 15 years ago, things are much stranger and they do, you know, events do seem to be accelerating yeah. Whatever that means, whether that's an, uh, an effect of the internet and the instantaneous communication that we have, whether you know the global network is is in some way you know becoming conscious is is waking up to itself. That was that was one of the scenarios that we tossed around as to what happened. Maybe that's happening. You know, I don't know. I don't know. I, I do think, in a sense, that. You know, in broad conception overall, the theory was right in that, you know, this, the novelty, the density of novelty is increasing. But to, you know, to, to tie it to a specific date, I think that was an error. And it, it doesn't work that way. Novelty does not ingress into the continuum in that way, you know, uh, 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 there are events which are certainly novel, and Terence was fond of talking about, uh, you know, an example was the detonation of the atomic bomb over Hiroshima. That was certainly a novel event, but what about all the events that had to happen in order to lead up to that? They were much quieter. But they were key events, ranging from the, you know, the point when Einstein thinking about the nature of space-time and, and so on, thought up the equations that, that postulate that it would be possible to build an atomic bomb or something like that, convert matter into energy. Uh, and then all the research uh, with the Manhattan Project, the research on, on uh, nuclear fission that went on with Oppenheimer and Fermi's group at Chicago, these were all novel events too, but nobody noticed because they were happening in the background. And then when the bomb finally exploded, that was the novel event. But 
you know, it was certainly a novel event, but it wasn't the novel event. So his idea was that the novelty kind of explodes into history, you know, and, and my idea is sort of that it, it leaks into history. And, you know, nobody notices until until you go down and the basement is flooded, you know, that kind of thing, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, it really does. Um, you know, your your experiment at La Chirera was probably the, one of the most interesting things I've ever read. <laughs> Can you get a little bit more into that? I mean, you're trying to create a fourth dimensional, super conductive thing with mushrooms and ayahuasca and other things. How does that occur how does that occur well you know you're you're going into an area where uh it's difficult to discuss it and not that i don't want to discuss it but uh that's one reason that i wrote my book uh was so that i wouldn't have to keep explaining this (laughs) okay And, and because it's hard to explain it it's hard to reconstruct it because it was so confusing at the time, you know, and and so I wrote the book so that I would have a an opportunity <laughs> to sit down without people having any expectation and explain to myself what happened or or reflect on it and try to unpack it and explicate it, you know. And so I have like there are about three or four chapters in the book that is basically about all of that stuff because, you know, there's no doubt that our trip to La Chirera and our attempt to do this thing, whatever it was, was a pivotal occurrence in both of our lives. I mean, I mean, Terrence and my life in some way can be defined as pre La Chirera and post La Chirera. Wow. You know, and we were only 20. I was 20. He was 24 when we went to La Chirera. So most of it has been post La Chirera. And a lot of it has been reflecting on, you know, uh, I mean, our lives have been lived out in the light of that just very peculiar uh, adventure and experience that we that we sort of... You know, we got in way over our heads. I mean, I mean, we had no idea really what we were getting into. You know, <laughs> uh, so I, I don't want to get into it because it's hard. It's hard to explain. People have to read the book. Yeah, we'll just we'll just get people to go read the book. Yeah. So yeah. I mean, why? But why? Why the Brotherhood of the Screaming Abyss? Where did that come from? Oh, well, that I can tell you. Well, the Brotherhood of the Screaming Abyss harkens back to. Uh, our common interest in science fiction when we were teenagers. And one of the writers that we were fascinated by was H.P. Lovecraft. And I don't know if you're familiar with Lovecraft, but he was a horror writer in the, in the 20s. And he was always talking about, you know, the, uh, the, uh, you know, the, the, the unspeakables, gibbering horrors from beyond the stars and and all this stuff you know i mean i mean uh, the beauty of and the genius of lovecraft is that he wrote this extremely scary science fiction novels science fiction horror i mean i would say he's probably the the inventor of that genre science fiction horror and a lot of it was about aliens and other dimensions and all that but it was always you know the gibbering abysses of cosmic space you never actually described very clearly what these things were he left that to your imagination you know but so when we were when we were um going to south america in quest of in quest of this secret you know which we thought was this exotic witoto hallucinogen but actually there was a secret but that wasn't it you know as we found out later but we we described ourselves as the brotherhood of the screaming abyss basically and in 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 a nod to hp lovecraft it was it was tongue in cheek right i mean we we didn't really take it that seriously but we i mean we took it seriously but we also had a certain sense of humor about it and that was that was it <laughs> do you, you know? think do you think the 21st century needs people like Terrence McKenna figure figureheading this movement, the psychedelic movement? 
Well, uh, obviously not, you know, because he's been gone for 15 years, you know, which is amazing. When I stopped to reflect on that, it was 15 years ago this month that he passed on, you know, and the psychedelic movement is more active and vibrant today than it ever was in his day. You know, but I would say also that it it does need Terence, and it has Terence. You know, I mean, he's got this; he's achieved this kind of immortality. You know, with all of his writings and all of his talks on the web and so on, they're all still out there, and and they're as timely today as they ever were. That's the amazing thing. I get so many young people telling me how, how much of an influence on their thinking that he was, you know, and they always say, oh, and you too, of course, but actually, <laughs> actually it's Terrence, you know, <laughs> which is fine. And, and he, he woke up a lot of young people and still does because, because he was, uh, you know, he was really at the height of his career, like in the early 90s, maybe 92, 93, 94. He was really out there. A lot of the folks that uh, come up to me or people that sign up for my classes, they were, you know, they were they were in diapers at that point, you know, but or, you know, quite young. So as they grew up and became adolescents and then young, young adults, they discovered Terence's ideas and writings, and they were influential on on them. and And so many people have told me, you know, every, I feel like everything I've learned, I owe to Terence. So, so that's a wonderful thing. Yeah, yeah. This is this is kind of a big question, and uh, if if at all possible, could, in, could you put into words what is what is your belief about the shape or truth of our reality? Uh, well, you know, I can always take the scientific cop out, you know, which is which is you know always a safe place to retreat to when you don't know the answer. But the answer is we don't know the answer. Uh, you know, I mean, science is great because you can always say, well, you know, we can suspend judgment, and that is the the essence of the scientific stance. You can always say. We do not have enough data to really answer this question. More data, you know, more data is needed to resolve this question. And, of course, in the way that science is practiced these days, you quickly follow up, oh, yes, we need more data, and, and by the way, we need more funding, and we need, you know, all the things that science runs on these days. But uh, it's okay to say that we have an incomplete picture of reality, you know, which we do. If you just look around, science is very, very good at dissecting and defining very small segments of reality, but it's not so good at putting everything together into a, a whole picture, a coherent picture of reality. And then you have the problem also, which is one thing that psychedelics certainly teach you. I mean, they, they teach you a lot of things, but one thing they clearly teach you is that really we are immersed in a hallucination all the time. You know, Every, consciousness itself is a reflection of a neurochemical brain state of some kind. And, uh, you know, is it real? Is, is what we see on psychedelics real versus what we see in quote unquote normal consciousness real? I think neither one is that real. You know, both of them are, are uh, aspects of this model of reality that we create, that our brain creates, and it's, it's necessary for it to do that. Otherwise, we, you know, it would be a blooming, buzzing confusion. A lot of what the brain does is it takes the raw datum of experience, you know, which, which physics tells us, if we believe our instruments, that external reality doesn't look anything like we experience reality. Everything is energy and vibrations and, you know, it's a quantum 
it's a it's it's a quantum state well that's not how we experience reality most of the time you know uh most of the time even on psychedelics reality has a certain coherence to it uh so i think the answer is again the answer is we don't totally know but i i think that uh very much the uh you know the the we we live inside of a hallucination that our brains create or, you know, we're the producers, directors, and the stars of our own movie, you know, and we call it the reality story. And, and everyone has their own, but they're close enough that, you know, there's something called consensus reality. But, you know, it's still a collective hallucination in some ways. Nobody knows what the fundamental nature of reality is because whatever it is, whatever comes to us from the outside comes to us through this sensory neural gating system, if you will. It's filtered and it makes sense. I mean, it's filtered and, and reconstructed so that it does make sense. This is a lot of what the brain does. Hmm. Uh, am I making sense? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. I mean, so so this is this is uh, you know this is one reason psychedelics are so interesting, uh, and and particularly DMT, I think, because in, in certain cases DMT kind of lets you step out of that framework and you get to look at reality in in the raw, if you will. It's like you can, it's like you can turn the circuit board over. You know, and see how this thing is wired, this reality machine. You know, and then and you see, oh, okay, this is how it works, right? Normally, you don't get to do that. You don't get to look at the nuts and bolts of it. So DMT gives you a few minutes where you can actually look at reality unfiltered, which is why it's so, uh, you know, so overwhelming and so fascinating. You can actually see the machinery that's generating this reality hallucination. So do you, do you think that these shamanic type experiences, hallucinations have an objective reality? Do they kind of coincide with what we experience here? I think that this is the $64,000 question. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that we cannot really answer that question. And, and I'm not even sure it's the right question. You know, um, in other words, when you start bandying about these terms, like, is it real? Is it not real? Is it inside? Is it outside? Are there other dimensions that you can access? Or is this all just a hallucination? Uh, you know, these are all charged terms, and they encourage fuzzy thinking. I mean, I'm not sure it's possible to think clearly about those. For for me to say, well, okay, you take ayahuasca and I see, you know, these places, these entities and all that, and people say, well, it's just a hallucination, or is this just a hallucination? And the key word there is just, right? Because what's implied there is, well, if it's just a hallucination, it has no value, and it has no reality, right? But I submit to you that what we experience in normal waking consciousness, that's also just a hallucination, you know? Hmm. It, but it is, but, you know, we need to get the word just out of it, because yes, it's a hallucination, it is what it is. It does have value, it's something you experience. So, uh, you know, this is basically this is phenomenology, uh, which says, you know, we take phenomena on on their on their face. You know, there may be nothing behind a phenomenon, but we experience. So, you know, a shaman goes into these altered states, encounters all of these entities, and and gets information and travels in these worlds and so on. Uh, and for that person, he he inter he or she interacts with those entities and those places as though they were real. 
you know, and so they may as well be real, right? I mean that that's the that's the thing. It, you know, if it looks like a duck and walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, it's it's probably a duck, you know. Uh, and it's that idea. It doesn't really provide any perspective on it to say, well, it's just a hallucination because every moment of waking consciousness is a dream. It is a hallucination. Do you think that culturally we are moving towards a better attitude towards psychedelic compounds? Oh, yeah. I don't think there's any question that we are. I mean, what's happened in the last five years for various reasons, I think both scientific discoveries and you know the the rising popularity of ayahuasca, the whole ayahuasca tourism thing, the media, uh, the fact that you know good science is being done on on some of these compounds, and we're seeing that they do have benefits. You know, I mean they they have benefits in the medical sense that can satisfy you know the hardest nosed, more most reductionist person who who may not be sympathetic to. You know all this woo-woo stuff, but it's hard to argue that okay, this person took psilocybin and you know stopped smoking or or something like that. And there's evidence accumulating that they have uh, definite benefits for people. And so, so that's kind of the admission price. If if psychedelics are going to be respectable, you've got to show that they're good for something. You know, not just to have uh, you know these experiences again. That there's nothing wrong with those experiences. That's that's a reflection of our culture's tendency to devalue these things. To say, well, there's there's no legitimacy. There's no value in an inner experience. You know. Now, of course, Eastern the Eastern mind, Eastern philosophy would say there is nothing but inner experience, and and you know. But I think in the West, I think if you can say these. These compounds have uses. They have applications. They can be used to treat PTSD. They can be used to interrupt addictions. They can be used for, you know, help people with existential anxiety at the end of life. All of these different medical applications that we're seeing emerge. So then it's like, okay, well, they're respectable. They're, it's okay. They're not so terrible. You know, and in the meantime, we've, you know, a lot of the reason this is coming out is because we've had, you know, 40 years to get used to them, 40 years to learn about them since they, you know, I mean, even longer, but, but in the sense that, you know, there was a big backlash against them at the end of the 60s and nobody knew what they were. They were complete and they were completely terrifying. So, to the governments and the reason they were terrifying to the governments is that they didn't understand them and uh, people would take them and they would have all these unconventional ideas you know which governments don't like like maybe I don't want to spend the rest of my life working in a cubicle for example or maybe I don't want to go over to Vietnam and, and kill these people you know why should I so Psychedelics were dangerous in that era, and they still are for much the same reason. You know, not that they're dangerous drugs. They give you dangerous ideas, and ideas that don't conform with the, you know, the accepted norms of what's what are always threatening to governments, institutions, governments and religions especially, I would say. And, you know, it was it was the... Uh, the impulse to control and try and stuff the genie back in the box in the bottle uh, that led to this prohibition. It was a kind of a, yeah, I mean, it was unfortunate because it also shut down all the research that was going on at that time, which was quite promising. So, you know, then it took 30 or 40 years to circle all the way back and see this research reactivated. Uh, and now that's happening. So yeah, I think that uh, attitudes, societal attitudes, are definitely uh, much more positive these days. Yeah, I know you're connected with the uh, Hefter 
Research Institute and the, there's right. the uh, MAPS Institute, which is, they're both right. making large progress in this realm. I mean, mm-hmm. we're, we're approaching the end here. And so I've got an interesting question. I mean, is there, is there anything that you would kind of go back in time and tell your younger self? <laughs> well, tell my younger self? Sure. Um, hmm, gosh. I don't know. It's hard to know. Um, that's a tough one. Um, I'm not sure. No, I, I don't really have. I don't really have any <laughs> regrets. I guess if I was going to tell myself, my younger self, anything, I would. I would say, uh, in terms of my academic and professional interests. Uh, you know, it, it sounds odd for me to say it, but I would say be more specialized. You know, one of my problems as an academic is I'm so interdisciplinary that I don't fit in anywhere. And, you know, I've worked in neuroscience and I've done postdocs in neuroscience, but then the question is, well, you're a botanist. What are you doing in neuroscience? And then the botanists say, well, you know, you're a pharmacologist. What are you doing in botany? And so in a way my interests have been so diverse that I have never really specialized. But in some ways I feel like maybe I could have been more effective if I had specialized, if I'd become a medicinal chemist or a psychiatrist or something like that. Maybe I didn't have the discipline to go through that and, and, and reach those points. But I mean, it's a tricky thing. I, you know, I have, friends, I have colleagues in the Hefter Institute and elsewhere who, you know, they have gone through that, They have, but they've always kept their interest in psychedelics kind of on the back burners, but they never lose it, you know, but to go through these professions and acquire the, you know, the professional status that you have to have, uh, you know, institutions do their best to brainwash you. And, you know, by the time you get through it, you've forgotten about why you started, you know, you've forgotten about the motivations that led you to undertake this. And, and then, you know, you're just boring and, uh, it hasn't happened to me, but it hasn't, it hasn't been good for my professional advancement either, particularly. Hmm. So, but I'm, you know. I have no regrets. I I feel privileged to be part of the Hefter Institute, and I worked with great colleagues. Um, so, you know, life is what it is. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that answer. Um, what what so what does the future hold for you, sir? I mean, what is there any new project or avenues of research that you're kind of getting into? Uh, yeah. Uh, Various things. Uh, I, I have been doing a, a lot of uh, retreats in South America lately uh, with ayahuasca, where I, I basically I work with a center there. Uh, that it's it's not an ayahuasca center exactly, but uh, I mean they do other things as well. It's kind of a tourist lodge kind of thing. Uh, but they do do uh, – they allow ayahuasca retreats maybe once or twice a year. And I've found a shaman that they introduced me to that I really like this guy and I like working with them. So I've been bringing people down there to have these retreats. And it's very interesting and rewarding to see people come down and have these uh, amazing transformative experiences. And the – impulse being a scientist my impulse is well that that would be enough but being a scientist my impulse is let's do some science around this let's do <laughs> some some clinical studies I mean, the, the thing with ayahuasca is you you know for various reasons you pr- you probably are not going to see clinical studies with ayahuasca done in the states because it doesn't fit into the paradigm you could you can do it with mdma you can do it with psilocybin you can do these things the the fda is okay with synthetic substances they're not so 
receptive to plant preparations. And ayahuasca is quintessentially an herbal medicine. So it's hard to do clinical studies in the States for various reasons because of this. I mean, for one thing, there's, you know, it's it's the same conundrum that faces cannabis research. There is no authorized uh, source of ayahuasca. Uh, you know, there isn't a government uh, licensed ayahuasca grower, uh, you know, so you can't get the material. Uh, you know, and it's kind of like cannabis where, you know, the only legitimate source of cannabis medicine is is National Institute on Drug Abuse. They control the supply for clinical studies. And generally, the weed that they have is pretty much garbage, you know. So it's hard to carry out, uh, you know, a good study. And what I've been saying is, well, why do we need to work within that FDA box? Why don't we just go to Peru and do these clinical studies? So in the in the future, and probably in the fairly near future, that's what we're going to do. We have a perfect venue to do it. We have a very good practitioner. We have connections with medical people in Peru and also we've got Hefter and all that. So I think we're going to do some clinical studies down there uh, in the next few years. You know, one of the problems is what are we going to screen for? What are, what are we going to look to treat? And of the spectrum of possible, you know, therapeutic targets and, uh, there is no ideal one, you know. Um, it's hard to decide. Is it going to be addiction? Is it going to be PTSD? Is it going to be, uh, you know, hospice, uh, end of life? I mean, these are what Hefter's investigating now. But how do you shift that down to Peru and and do a different medicine? And it, is it even necessary? You know, so. Yeah, we'll, we'll see how it out, what the outcome is in a couple of years. Well, Mr. McKenna, I I really appreciate you making the time. Where can people find your work? They can buy the book off Amazon, uh, brother. You know, the Brotherhood of the Screaming Abyss, and then I have a website of the same name without the the. So just Brotherhood of the Screaming Abyss dot com. You can order the book there, and. Uh, and get a signed copy. So that's, that's useful. I don't charge for the signature. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And you can just order the book from there or you can get it off Amazon. I, I have to, my inventory on Amazon is getting low. I, I intend to send another bunch to them. So there should be, there should be plenty on Amazon that those two things are the easiest uh, way to, uh, to get my book. And the rest of it is just out there. You know, put my name into YouTube and all kinds of stuff comes up. (laughs) Well, uh, you heard it here, guys. Thank you so much for listening. This is The Human Experience. My name is Xavier and my guest, Mr. Dennis McKenna. Thank you so much for being here, Dennis. It was a pleasure. We will see you guys next week. Thanks.